Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Baseline 52-Week Bible Course. If you'd like to have this course in paperback format or in PDF downloadable format, it's available at fathersheartmedia.com. In this section of this 52-week course, we're talking about the what some people call the five-fold ministry, the ministry gifts that Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 tell us that Jesus gave. He was ascending up to heaven with the liberated Old Testament captives and he paused to, during that point from the second heaven he paused to release mantles and office gifts upon the earth to equip his ecclesia, to equip you, to equip his people to grow up into the full measure of the stature of Christ, to produce in the earth, in our humanity, all that he intended when he went to the cross, when he rose from the dead. Uh, it's very important that you and I understand this. We tend to see, uh, in our culture of Christianity, we tend to see leadership as we have pastors, we might acknowledge teachers or evangelists, but we don't. I recognize, unfortunately, uh, apostles and prophets, and even if we do, we don't uh, see them as necessary. They're more of uh, an option. It's like if you buy a car, you could get it with an optional moonroof and power windows, but it's not necessary for that car to perform its function to have those things. But yet, when you see the fivefold ministry as it's presented in the Gospels in Ephesians chapter 4, it uh, does not say, well, you have a pastor, and that's good, uh, and uh, you can dabble with these other ministries that might you know, keep you from being bored in your Christian walk. Uh, no, when the ministry of pastor is listed, it's listed in the company with four other ministries. If, if all you believe, and many churches, and many who claim to have a fuller knowledge of God's purposes than other groups, you need to understand if all you accept is a pastor, then a pastor is just the 20% solution. And that's an anemic experience of the grace of God that Jesus intended for leaders to bring to you. You want to have not just one-fifth, you want to have the full, robust, complete spectrum of the character of God imparted in the office gifts and the office ministries. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and the teacher. You get to have it all. Matthew 6.33 says, if you seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you, and part of that all are these ministry giftings that are not there to suppress you, that are not there to foster in you as, as some eternal dependence upon religious infrastructure, but they're there to equip you to grow up into the full measure of the stature of Christ, whatever that looks like, with your skin on. Now, we talked last, yesterday, last week rather, about the apostle. And we're going to talk about the prophet today. You know, Jehoshaphat, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, he stood before his people and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Now think about that. He's touching on one of the fivefold ministries that was actually survived um, implementation out of the Old Covenant into the New. Why? Because prophets were needed under the Old Covenant so that people would prosper. Did you see what that said? Believe in the prophets, so shall you prosper. Well, people needed to prosper under the Old Covenant economy of God, and you need to prosper today. Now, But he said, the first part, he said, believe the Lord your God. So shall you be established. Well, you know, that's an evangelist brings people to belief in God. An apostle establishes people in the belief of God. Uh, a teacher instructs you in your belief in God. A pastor nurtures you in your belief in God. But what does a prophet do? A prophet deals primarily with those that already believe in God. Okay, you believe in God, you're established, your heaven is secure, but are you prospering? See, people believe in God, but they're not prospering. That's, that's stagnation. That's living below your privileges. My late mother, 
made the statement. She said, I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be embarrassed to see how far below our privileges we've lived. Uh, the, all of the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the evangelist, uh, the pastor, the teacher, they're there to establish, to nurture you in your belief in God, that you might be established. But the prophet has a unique place. He's not there just to establish you. You have other ministries for that. You need to prosper. And there are people populating churches around the world today. They're going to heaven when they die, but they're living through hell here on earth because they have not been trained. They have not been a part of a religious culture that was open to prophetic ministry. Uh, people uh, around the world have this sentiment echoing in their heart. There ain't nothing wrong, but something ain't right. Because you're not experiencing the full spectrum of what Jesus died to provide you on this side of heaven. Well, the prophet is there to make that happen. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe the prophet. Who's the prophet in your life? You know who your pastor is. You're established. Who's the prophet in your life? Are, are you prospering? If you're not prospering, perhaps there is a dimension of the gift, leadership gifts of God that could assist you if you choose to believe Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12. We get response all the time. People don't believe in the prophetic. Well, you need to tear that chapter out of your Bible. You just need to get rid of it. God asks me all the time. He says, uh, you got to make your mind up if you believe this stuff. <laughs> Believe in the Lord your God. Believe in the prophets, so shall you prosper. You can even read in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of God and prophecy. They're given that you might profit with them. Uh, people have trouble with prosperity. God doesn't want you to prosper, then quit your job. God doesn't want you to be healed. He's using that sickness. Uh, he put that sickness on you as a cross to bear. Then why are you going to the doctor? Why don't you just go inject yourself with hepatitis C and get yourself in the will of God? See, we don't, we don't believe those things. We use them as patent excuses as to why we're not experiencing what the Bible plainly promises us. God wants you to get what Jesus paid for on the cross. And that what he paid for is that you might be established, but not just established, that you might prosper as well. Believe the prophets that you might prosper. Who's the prophet in your life? An overview of the church today reveals that a great many people are less than prosperous. Christianity itself, Christianity as a whole, hovers on the periphery of society more and more with little real influence or power. The fact that the world often influences the Christian to a greater degree then the church influences the world. That, that's an unfortunate and painful reality. Venues of, of worldly activity and entertainment, they're packed. They're sold, they're sold out. But yet, church pews seem to be more often vacant. In England, less than 10% of the population even remotely acknowledges Christian beliefs in any form. In America... 64% of the population acknowledge a Christian belief. However, only a small part of that percentage are even marginally involved in kingdom life. Uh, in spite of the public relations hype of the religious institutions of our day, the church and Christianity are a pitiful caricature of the glorious church Jesus said he was coming back when he returns. The modern church has a great need to be exposed to valid prophetic influence. And it is just this influence that the Father is making available more and more in our day. The Bible says there will be many false prophets in the last days, Jesus remarked. That's because there's going to be many true prophets. Why are the prophets here? That you might prosper. He's bringing a, a transfer of prosperity in relationships and finances. But yet we have foundations, prophetic ministries foundational to the church. And Psalm 11.3 says that if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Now, what are the foundations? Well, we're built upon Jesus. Yes, we are. But Jesus extends his foundational influence through some office gifts. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. 
It says, Now therefore you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, did you get that? Whether we like it or whether we not, we're not. People say, well, the church is built on truth. It doesn't say the church is built on truth except through the fact that Jesus is the personification of truth. But this verse says that part of the foundation is ministry gifting that Jesus released in Ephesians 4, 11, called the apostles and the prophets. And if you, the Bible says if you don't build your house on the foundation, Jesus said, it's going to fall. And if you do not have apostolic prophetic ministry in your life, if you don't know who's the apostolic father in your life, who's the prophetic voice in your life, if you don't know that, then you are subject, you're vulnerable more than is necessary. Jesus paid a price and he made arrangement that you not live in that level of vulnerability, but you have to make yourself available to that ministry. Notice that it doesn't say that pastors are the foundation of, of the church. Isn't that interesting when we have a pastor-centric religious culture that doesn't see anything past the pastor, an occasional evangelist? Uh, I'm not down on pastors. I'm a third-generation pastor. Uh, most of the men in my family have served in full-time ministry going back three generations. I understand pastoral ministry, and I know why pastors tend not to be open to the prophetic. Pastors are about green pastures and still waters. Prophets are about let's shake things up and get something done for God. <laughs> well, you need both. It's not enough just to say when you get to heaven when he asks, well, why didn't you take advantage of the gifts I gave you? Well, my pastor just wasn't into the prophetic. I wonder what the response of heaven would be at that. You're responsible for your own walk with God. It's not enough to say, well, my church didn't believe in it. No, you have to decide where your loyalties lie. Do they lie? Not that we shouldn't be loyal to our local church, but is your loyalty to your local church doctrine and practice greater than your loyalty to what the clear promise of Scripture is? We're not straining at theological gnats here. He says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Who's the apostle? Who's the foundational apostle in your life? Who's the papa apostle in your life? Who's the papa prophet in your life? We spoke about apostles last week. Jesus Christ, yes, he's the chief cornerstone we'd never take away from him. Uh, but yet, he, the Jesus who is the chief cornerstone, he gave you something and he wants you to take advantage of it. Prophets and apostles are foundational to the church the, that the Bible describes. But to the modern church and Christian culture, the apostle and the prophet are just an oddity, uh, held generally in disdain and, and with suspicion. We say, Pastor so-and-so, Pastor, you know, whatever your pastor's name is, Pastor T.D. Jakes, pa Evangelist Billy Graham. And we don't think they're being ostentatious when they use that. To, that's who they are. That's what they do. But if we say apostle thus and so, or prophet thus and so, we roll our eyes and we say, yeah, well, they think there's something. And it's, it's a general disdain. And I hear the Lord say, how's that working for you? Or do, is the church of today a reflection of the church of the first century? Or is, are we in the high watermark of the glory of God in our day? Or is there something lacking? We're established. We're going to heaven. But are we prospering? We need the prophetic. You need a prophet in your life. The religious crowd of the day rejects the foundation upon which Jesus said, he would build and construct his church. Even in so-called full gospel circles, a ministry is only uh, acknowledged, you're either a pastor or an evangelist. And if he declares that he has a prophetic or an apostolic calling, then he is wrongly regarded as being puffed up, presumptuous, or in error. What's wrong with this picture? We have to make your, our mind up. Do we believe the scripture? Do we believe what the scriptures say? The rejection of the prophetic is typical of the religious system of our day. The book of Revelation talks about the fact that apostles and prophets would not be accepted in the end times. 
It symbolizes the established, the Babylon in the book of Revelation symbolizes the established religious systems in our time. In Revelations 18, the destruction of these systems are foretold and the response of the destruction of organized cultural religion is spoken of in verse 20 of Revelations 18. It says, Rejoice over her, you holy apostles and prophets, because for God hath avenged you on her. In other words, there would be a religious climate that would reject apostles and prophets. And if your pastor or your church is a climate that is not amenable to apostolic ministry, to prophetic ministry, then it has been contaminated. It has been infected by the spirit of Babylon. And we need to love them out of it. Now, I understand, you know, uh, there's a lot of arrogance in the prophetic. That's why for us, our understanding of the prophetic, we're not here to stomp on toes. We're here to wash feet. We're here to love. Love never fails. Why would we step out of love to try and get something done? People uh, are obnoxious, arrogant, mouthy, and smart-alecky, and they say, well, that's who I am. I'm just prophetic. No, you're not prophetic. You're immature. You've misunderstood. You don't know what the prophetic is. You don't understand that Jesus reconfigured the prophetic when they wanted to call down fire from heaven, and Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Jesus reconfigured the prophetic from the law of sin and death under the old covenant to the law of grace and the law of life in Christ Jesus. And you need to understand that if you're going to walk in prophetic gifting or in prophetic office. Now, the scripture gives us this key then that discovering the Babylon church today. She, the Babylon church is a system that opposes the ministry of the prophet and the apostle. Notice that the verse, if you're, that the verse does not tell the pastors and evangelists or teachers to rejoice because Babylon doesn't persecute these ministries. Babylon will accept pastors, evangelists, and teachers, but she will rail and she will mock the ministry of the prophets and the apostles. Why? Because Satan knows the word. If he can't get the churches to reject Jesus, that he will get them to reject the ministers through whom Jesus extends his foundational uh, influence and ministry. Babylon is not simply the Catholic Church. Rome is Babylon. That's what uh, Protestants and evangelicals are fond of saying. <laughs> but it's any church that rejects God-given ministry that Jesus has arranged for our benefit and for our blessing. Now, those concerned, what's the road to restoration? If you're concerned with moving the church back to a biblically revealed model, then you must be prepared to acknowledge the ministries of apostles and prophets. You must be prepared to do that, though you get criticized, though your pastor says, well, we don't need you here. I see people all the time ask to leave perfectly good churches because they believe in the prophetic gifts. They believe in the full spectrum of the fivefold ministry. See, these ministries of apostle and prophet, they must be identified and validated and nurtured. And the false ministries must be exposed without rejecting the genuine. The scripture says it is first apostles, secondarily prophets. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. Now, people always say prophets were for the Old Covenant and that the foundation of the prophets was the Old Testament prophets. That's not what this says. He set some in the church. The church is a New Covenant convention. He didn't say he set some of the church first pastors and they keep every, everybody in line and protected from those that claim to be apostles and prophets. That's not what it says. He set some in the church first apostles, Papa apostles, and we talked about their function last week. Secondarily, prophets. He set prophets in the church. And then after that, teachers. Amazingly, he still didn't mention pastors. Isn't that amazing? First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. We need to have these gifts in the church. This verse does not merely apply to Old Testament prophets because they predated the apostles. And therefore, it this verse confirms the existence of New Testament prophetic ministry uh, of apostles and prophets. And while now the apostolic ministry is spoken of as an office, 
prophetic ministry is more spoken of as a mantle. Now, now again, apostolic ministry is spoken of more as an office. Prophetic ministry is, while it is an office, it's spoken more of as a mantle. Why is it important to understand? Because Paul was not an apostle to everybody. He, uh, Paul was uh, an apostle to the group he was called by God to, i.e. the Gentiles. A prophet, however, is a prophet wherever he travels because the prophetic ministry emphasizes anointing rather than geographically fixed office. See, the apostolic ministry was spoken of as, by Paul as having a measure. He would say, I'm an apostle to this group. I may not be an apostle to you, but a prophet is a prophet wherever he goes. Uh, office gifts have jurisdiction. Therefore, if a great apostle in Michigan visits the church in Louisiana, well, he would just be a traveling brother. But a prophet, on the other hand, is a prophet wherever he goes for his prophetic mantle flows out of an abiding anointing upon his life. Now, what is the prophet's job? A prophet demonstrates the voice of God in the lives of the people. He activates the voice of God in the lives of the people. Uh, the prophet's role involves him in motivating you, in ministering to your morale, provoking and encouraging you as a man and woman of God to go out and fulfill your destiny, to hear the Father's voice for yourself and to step out boldly in the things that God has for you. That's what prospers you. Audacity prospers the believer. And a prophet is there to provoke you to audacity. If the prophets you're around uh, make you not want to be in the meetings, if they're stalking the aisles, discerning everybody, you need to either get rid of the prophet or get out of that church. Because that's not prophetic ministry. And if that's what you see you are, and your ministry is one of stalking the aisles, seeing who you're going to rebuke next, can I just say to you, uh, re-examine your understanding of the prophetic. Re-examine the character of Christ. Jesus didn't come to stomp on toes and to make people feel insecure. He came to minister. He came to bless. He came to assist. He came to love and encourage. And we need to be a part of that and allow that to happen. Uh, another thing is a prophet is there to encourage you to act, to get you to get out of the boat. Like Peter got out of the boat against the advice of uh, 11 of the most spiritual people of his day. Uh, a prophet, uh, if you could use word pictures, he's not a porch swing, he's a diving board. It's time to get up and go and do what God said do. Let's do something if we do it wrong because God will even make our mistakes to prosper. <laughs> A prophet is a diving board encouraging you to step out in the personal plan of God for your life. The apostle commissions people to a vision. The prophet motivates you to commit to that vision. The evangelist, he recruits new people to the vision. The, the pastor, he nurtures people as they prosecute, as they pursue the vision. The teacher, he instructs on how to carry the vision out. So we need to understand we don't need just one of the ministries or two. We need the full spectrum of the fivefold ministry. See, the prophet reinforces um, the provocative motivation, provoking you to step out, not just be passive, to step out. Uh, he'll speak against wrong motivations of passivity and sitting back. And it's like all of the do nothing, sit around, decide there ain't nothing to do. Well, the prophet's there to encourage that not to happen. When Nathan came to David in 2 Samuel 7, verse uh, 2 and 3, it said that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, and the ark of God dwells behind curtains. And Nathan said, Go do what's in your heart. That's what a prophet says. A prophet connects you to the more than you could ever ask or think God. He didn't tell him, oh, no, you're a bad guy. You can't do that. Who do you think you are? You're not spiritual enough. No, he said, go do what's in your heart. Step out. And we find King David steps out and begins to do the thing that God laid upon his heart. And yes, there was correction that came, but it came uh, through other means. God uses the prophetic to provoke you. As a Christian, when you are striving to serve the Lord, the prophet's voice in your life will reinforce those good intentions. 
The prophet will lift you up and he'll instruct you through his counsel and through his words of wisdom and knowledge. Prophets are men and women that uh, are meant to motivate you and to inspire you. Uh, they do minister from the context of their own personalities. Sometimes they're quiet and still. Other times they're raging and torrential like John the Baptist. Uh, the prophet proclaims a message. He speaks openly to men on behalf of God. Along with the apostles, they are foundational to your life. Prophets are not just foretellers. We're not, we're not psychics or clairvoyants. We are forth tellers, forth speaking what the Lord has said, rather than just foretelling the future. Uh, they prophesy to groups as well as to individuals. They will submit their prophecies, yes, because they, who do they submit their prophecies to? A prophet submits his prophecy to the one he prophesies to. Only you, only you can determine. People ask all the time, would you tell me what that prophecy meant? Uh, yes, I could, but that's not my job. It's not my job to tell you what your prophecy means. You are the only one that can establish the value of the prophetic word that has come to you. And you, likewise, you are the only one who can be accountable for that word. But don't take the attitude to say, well, just put it on the shelf and it comes to pass. Okay, so be it. The Bible says, that Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.18 to war a good warfare by the prophecies he had received. He didn't tell him to put them on the shelf. He said, go to war with them. So you're in a warfare. You need to take those prophecies in war with them. Don't you take that passive attitude uh, that's just the safe way out. You'll be a careful failure. God doesn't want that for you. You need to take those prophetic words, try them, ask them for confirmation, ask God to repeat them to you so you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's what he's saying, and then step out boldly and know, I'm going to do something if I do it wrong, and God will even make your mistakes to prosper, and you'll fulfill your destiny and be everything that God's called you to be. God bless you. It's been wonderful to talk to you today about the prophetic. We'll continue next week, and we're going to continue the next several weeks to cover evangelist pastor and teacher. God bless.